I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking about an inspirational book. It is called Behind the Cross, The Depths of the Work of the Cross. It is written by Rick Combs. It is a thought-provoking book that delves into the spiritual realm behind the crucifixion of Jesus. It explores the unseen realities of the courtroom of heaven with God as judge, Satan as the prosecutor, and Jesus as the defendant. The book is divided into three sections, each focusing on a different aspect of the significance of the cross, including what is behind it, what it gives us, and commentary on Romans 6 through 8. We are delighted to have Rick join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Great Writers Media for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel. Rick, so good to see you today, my friend. Thank you, Logan. It's good to be with you. This is a perfect time of year. We just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, so it's good time to talk about the cross and the significance, significance. of it. Let's tell the folks at home a little bit what your book is about. Coming out of Holy Week, as we call it, um, we look at Good Friday, which we celebrate when Jesus was crucified on the cross. And then we move into Sunday uh, when we remember the resurrection. Um, the cross is the central issue of Christianity. Without the cross, we have nothing. We don't have salvation. We don't have redemption. We don't have forgiveness of sins. And when you think of the cross as a package deal, when you think of the cross that Jesus died on for our sins, also think of the resurrection. Because if it ends at the cross, Jesus is just another guy who believed in the cause that died for it. And that's where it ends. That means nothing. A dead savior is no savior at all. Mm -hmm. So when we have the resurrection, that Jesus showing himself to be God, I mean, I can't raise myself from the dead. You can't raise yourself from the dead. At least you told me you couldn't. <laughs> but when we, when we look at the resurrection of Jesus, it showed that he was God. And he has authority in heaven and in earth. So that gives us our justification. So that's what the book is about. I was concerned that so much of the time, uh, we don't talk about the cross. We talk about everything else, but we don't talk about the cross, which is the very thing that we need to be talking about. I know in my church, uh, one of the things that we do quite often is communion. And I love that because it keeps us focused on the cross and what Jesus does for us. It's the shedding of blood that brings the forgiveness of sins. So I, I talk about that in the book. I go through some of the history of crucifixion, which, by the way, uh, means excruciating mm. pain. He suffered more than any other man in the history of civilization. The book of Isaiah tells us that Jesus was marred be what any other man in all of history had been marred. Um, I saw a picture recently that showed um, an illustration of what Jesus' body looked like. And it was from the backside, looking at his back. Literally, his skin and his muscles were ripped away from his bones. And you could see the bones. You know, if we saw something like that, we would definitely be horrified. So, but see, that's the love of God. That's his grace and that's his mercy. God became man, dwelt among us, lived among us, and then gave himself to die for our sins and was buried and was raised from the dead that we might be saved and have eternal life with Jesus. But I always say, the requirement is to believe that. 
You can just know it and have knowledge of it, but it does nothing for you. But we must believe and trust. I like to say, lean upon that truth. And that salvation comes from. So that's what the book's all about. I yeah. go through details of the cross and how it can relate to us today in the here and now. Tell us a little bit about this concept of the courtroom of heaven that you talk about. Well, behind the cross is what I wanted to do and was the idea of that image. When Jesus died on the cross, first of all, Satan wanted to kill him, get rid of him, because he knew who he was. He knew that he was the Son of God. So in his mind, uh, the last thing he wants is redemption for the entire earth. So he killed the Messiah. What we don't realize and what is explained in Psalms chapter 22, uh, and I've got a couple of chapters on that psalm explaining this, that Satan and all of his cohorts, all of his minions, all of his devils showed up at the cross in the unseen uh, realm. That's why I call it behind the cross. We know the event but do we know what happened behind that event in the realm of the unseen, the spiritual realm? So behind the event, we have hordes, the hordes of hell is what I'd like to call it. Satan and his minions condemning him and throwing at him, accusing him of every sin known to man. And, you know, you're a robber, you're a murderer, you're a thief, you're full of pride, you're a gluttonous. He took every sin from the law and hurled it at Jesus, condemning him of sin. And the Bible says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that God, that Jesus took our sin upon himself, paid the penalty, and then in exchange, gave to us his righteousness. So that's the great exchange. He took our sin, and he gave us his righteousness. And that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. And eternal life, which is yes. a, a pretty good deal as well. You've been involved in the ministry, as we talked about earlier, for about a half a century, as incredible as that is. Here in the year 2023, what would you say the state of faith is in this nation? It's waning. Mm -hmm. um, the church has always been, uh, in the Bible, the church has always been compared to Israel. And when God developed that nation uh, from Abraham, you probably are familiar with the story. And then out of Abraham's seed, a great nation erupted, I'd like to say, the nation of Israel. And the call of Israel was to bless every nation. So God had a plan, and he wanted to use Israel to take back from the devil the authority of the earth. Because right now, Satan's in charge. Yeah. Why is there so much sin? Why is there so much calamity? Why in history has every nation eventually been corrupted and fallen? And we're starting to see that in our own beloved United States of America. We're seeing that progress right now. So Satan is in charge. He's the God of this world right now. So Israel comes along by the hand of God to use that nation to re reconcile the earth back to God. And so, but but Israel wasn't faithful. And Israel went after their own gods. And Israel did not serve the one true God. So when Jesus came to Israel to bring in the kingdom, they rejected him. And they said to Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. So they rejected Jesus as their king. 
And so the important thing is, um, in that rejection, we fell. If we parallel the church today with that, through church history, we are seeing the same thing happen. The church now, unfortunately, I believe is in a state of apostasy because we are moving further and further and further away from God. Is more entertainment. Mm. As I said earlier, the cross is never mentioned. People are con- uh, confused about what salvation is and how to be saved, what eternal life is. There's confusion abounding, and the devil's behind that. Yeah. He he hides the truth. He doesn't want us to know what the truth is. So that's the state that the church is in. And uh, I believe the times are getting very close to the return of the Lord because the church is not doing their job. You know, the church and Christians in particular seem to be targeted by the media that want to make a joke of the clergyman that want to make a joke of the faithful, that want to destroy the nuclear family, that want to elevate that which is perverse. Uh, It's a very strange time we're living in, particularly when you look at that, which I just described, coupled by unheard of violence, you know, befalling this country. I mean, there's a different mass shooting every day, it seems. Yes. And a lot of this has to do with a lack of faith, a lack of belief. And like you said, Satan's voice being heard loud and clear. Jesus made a promise. And and we love the promises of God. And in particular, we love the promises of Jesus. And to those, we say amen. But we forget about one promise he did make. He told his disciples— If you follow me, you will have tribulation, and you will be persecuted. So that's a promise. So Satan does stand. The word Satan means adversary. Mm -hmm. He opposes God and everything that God does. So the best way for Satan to get to God is through his kids. Mm -hmm. That's us, his Christians. So things are going very bad and things are going very wrong because Satan is the god of this world. Ephesians chapter 2 says that the devil is a horse for this world. Every nation follows along a certain horse, a certain path, and that path is always down. It always declines. Sin always declines every time, takes down a nation with it, because that's the nature of sin. And so, yes, things are going to get progressively worse and worse and worse. But as Christians, if we believe in the message of the cross, we can be a light unto everybody around us. You and I, Logan, are lights right now just talking about this. There may be somebody listening right now that maybe have not quite connected salvation with the work of the cross that Jesus did. So that's a big light. The Bible says that in the latter days, things will get progressively worse, and uh, we need to not be afraid of that, but just shine as lights and uh, just realize the hope that we have of the coming King. Absolutely. Amen, for sure. I'm glad you wrote this book. Uh, I think it's important that the cross is explored, that the cross is thought about, contemplated, um, all of its meanings on many levels. But you've written other books as well. Uh, Three other books, two other books. Tell me about those. Well, four total Mm-hmm. Um, the very first one is called Biblical Christianity 101 that was released in 2020, right during the pandemic. Um, and uh, I had lots of time to do some writing. About four years ago, I started writing articles that I posted on my uh, Facebook. 
and social media. And somebody, after I had gotten about maybe eight months into it, somebody suggested that it would be a great idea to pub publish those into a book. Mm -hmm. So that's how that book came about. I was concerned that the subject of salvation, eternal life, was muddied. Mm -hmm. It wasn't clear and well explained. And so that's why I wrote that book. And it goes through all of the basics of Christianity, grace, what is salvation, what is the love of God, what is eternal life, and what does that mean for us today? So that book literally has gone around the world. Do you want to know the country that I get the most uh, references from and communication? Africa, the continent wow. of Africa, believe it or not. Yeah. The missionaries have done their work then if they are yeah. getting inquiries from Africa, right? It's so true. And other nations, but the bulk of it has been from Africa. So they are using uh, some of my books as curriculum for their churches. So that's what it's for. You know, right. they're meant to be studied and to be read over very carefully and among the people. Must be rewarding. I mean, you preached as a pastor for many, many years, and you reached X number of people, and through them, they reached X number of people. But now you're leaving a legacy of words that will continue in perpetuity, which has to be rewarding. That is very true. Uh, you know, I go back, well, I'm going to be really open here. I'm mm. 70. Uh, you're a young looking 70, my friend. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I uh, was raised in a generation. There were no computers. There were no cell phones. There were no iPads, uh, no laptops. You could never even think of doing what you and I are doing right now, Logan. Exactly. That was unheard of. And if you wanted to be on TV, quote unquote, you mm -hmm. had to spend thousands of dollars to work and get it all done. Well, today... Books can be published very cheaply if you know what you're doing. Right. And uh, I use Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Mm -hmm. And through those two platforms, these books have gone around the world. Wonderful. I get I get uh, comments from everywhere. And so it's just very satisfying and gratifying to see that I used to say that um, I'm full of it. And he was saying that in a good way. Um, I have a lot to say. Right. And I was um, just, you know, gifted with the ability to be able to write. I love to write. Yep. It comes naturally to me. And so um, right now I'm working on book number five. What, can you tell us a little bit about that one? Please do. I was hoping that you would. Sure. It's called The Greatest Epic of the Ages. The Greatest Epic of the Ages. The Greatest Epic of the Ages probably will be uh, released in June. If you think about it, the Bible is the greatest epic ever told. True. It starts at the very beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. And at the very beginning, there was unity. Well, every epic has the people Every epic has a villain. Mm -hmm. We know who that is. Yeah. Every epic has the hero. And so I go through as an overview of the entire Bible from beginning to end. Uh, and then at the very end, uh, when the Antichrist, uh, Satan, through the Antichrist, is getting ready to just wipe away everybody and become the God of heaven and earth and and he's made it, and he has won. At the very last minute, the hero, the Lord Jesus Christ, literally, from Revelation 19, comes riding in on a white horse, hmm. slaughters all of his enemies, right. and becomes the God of this world once again, and, and saves all of those believers who are waiting for him. So, you know, that is one great epic.
That is a great epic. And the book of Revelation, to me, doesn't seem like it is explored or discussed enough. No, um, and I'm going to do that. Yeah. I'm about halfway through right now. I'm just um, getting into Paul's ministry and the dispensation of grace that we're living in now. But then I'll move beyond that into the Hebrew epistles which are written to the Jews during that time to prepare them for the tribulation, the judgment of God that will come upon the whole world, and then move on through uh, Revelation and then to chapter 19 when Jesus uh, returns. I call it the great return. Mm -hmm. um, and it is it is a wild story. I... Has, uh, Satan has hidden hidden um, some of the graphic uh, truth that is in the Bible about his return. But when Jesus returns, it literally is a slaughter. Mm -hmm. You have millions of people, their armies from all nations lined up in Armageddon, uh, Megiddo in Israel. Imagine this, to fight against God. I mean, how could you be so delusional as to think you can fight against God and win? Mm. So Jesus comes riding in, literally slaughters them, so much so that the blood flows for miles and is, is as high as the horse's bridle. Mm. And the birds are called in by God to eat the flesh of the dead armies. Mm. That's graphic, and yeah. that's horrific, but it tells us two things. First, it tells us about the power of God, and second, it tells us about the love and the mercy and the grace of God. To, you know, I hear people all the time, this world is such a mess. Why doesn't God do something? Can mm. he come and end all of this? I'm sure you've heard about that. Yeah. Well, one day, he quite is. Right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting when it comes to divine intervention, because we don't want to be puppets on a string. We want to have free will. And uh, unfortunately, you know, you have people creating destruction with their free will. Fortunately, we have people like you creating good works that renew one's faith as well. So hopefully the good side outweighs the bad side eventually. Yes, um, I think we need to maybe tweak that just a little bit. That's the kind of the common thought. Mm -hmm. But uh, Christians, true believers have, in Jesus, have always been the minority. Right. In Israel, when Jesus came, um, the remnant, the believers that believed the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus was preaching was a small minority. The big established Jewish leadership was in control, and they were the majority. And I'll just let your readers uh, read Matthew chapter 23 to see what he had to say to them. So it's like it is today. Those who truly believe in the cross and are redeemed and believe in Jesus are in the minority, and we need to be faithful keep our mind on the hope and realize that one day Jesus is going to come literally, personally, physically, and set things straight. And then in his kingdom, there will be peace. The curse of the earth will be lifted. He will reign in righteousness and completely just. Amen. And to that, I can say amen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> amen. Indeed. Great thoughts. Um, you've obviously spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff, speaking to people about it, reading, researching. It's your life's work and it reflects in your work. And uh, it is quite amazing. The name of the book is be uh, behind the cross, the depths of the work of the cross. Let me ask you about the second part of that. What do you mean by the depths of the work of the cross? Well, um, in the in the section, the cross brings blessings to us today. 
And so in the second section, I talk about those blessings, that we have redemption, we have forgiveness, we have a justice. There's about eight of those blessings that we, we can receive as a result of the work of the cross. And then in section three, I do a commentary on Romans chapter six, seven, and eight. And uh, Romans chapter six basically tells us because of the cross, we're dead to sin. Did you realize we're dead to sin because we're alive in Christ? So sin has no power over us. And then in Romans chapter 7, Paul um, goes into some detail about his struggle with the law. My flesh just does whatever it wants to do, and it always lets me down. And he comes to the end of Romans chapter 7, what am I going to do? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm miserable. I'm condemning myself. And then he goes into Romans chapter eight and says, we don't have to have self-condemnation because we are not condemned by the cross, by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can live by the spirit. We can override what our flesh wants to do. We can the law and fulfill it by walking in the spirit. So it goes into that kind of depth. And I thought it was important not just to talk about the cross, but what happened behind the cross in the spiritual realm, and then to go into the depths of the work of the cross for our personal lives. Because if it doesn't mean something to you and me today, it's worthless. Right. So those two sections are very important for us to the real life handle of what the work of the cross is all about in my life and in your life. Wonderful. It's a great book. It is faith renewing. It is spiritual healing for your soul. It is called Behind the Cross, The Depths of the Work of the Cross by Rick Combs. It's available on Amazon. It's available virtually anywhere you buy books. Rick has other books available online as well. While you're checking out this work, check out the other works as well, as well as a forthcoming book, which is called The Epic Story of All Time. What's it called again? No, The Epic of the Ages. The, the Epic greatest, of the Ages. Yeah, Excellent. The greatest epic of the ages. Yeah. Looking forward it to that release as well. Yeah. All right, Rick, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you. Good to be with you, Logan, and God bless you. God bless you, sir. Good being with you as well. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time until next time on Spotlight.